Funding for New York Now is provided by WNET. CSEA. I love my job just because it's such an awesome way to give back to the community. Knowing that I can help out and knowing that I do every day makes me feel great. The work that I do is shaping the community in a really positive way, and I'm really proud of that. Winner of a New York State Emmy for Best Political Program, this is New York Now. Hi everyone and welcome to New York Now. I'm Casey Seiler from the Times Union. My partner Matt Ryan will join us in just a few minutes. But first we're starting at the Reporters Roundtable for analysis of the week's news where I'm happy to be joined by Yancey Roy from Newsday and Karen DeWitt from New York State Public Radio. All right, the days dwindled down to a precious few and we don't yet know if there's going to be a special session where maybe lawmakers could exchange agenda items that the governor wants in exchange perhaps for a pay raise. It is a season of exchanging gifts, <laughs> apparently. Um, uh, on Thursday, there was sniping. The latest episode was sniping between Senate Republican leader John Flanagan and Governor Andrew Cuomo, both of whom are saying that the other is the impediment to a special session occurring. Yancey, you have an outstanding theory on what this might be a sign of. Well, folks who've been around the Capitol uh, for a long time say that the rule of thumb is there has to be three blow-ups for every agreement that's reached. So in that context, sniping at each other a few days before you might come to Albany, that's a sign of progress. <laughs> that's, um, that's because right. That's kind of the, the it, lore that, it's set, that it has to blow up three times. But it usually ends up being true. He's, he's already, right. uh, Cuomo and Assembly Speaker Carl Hasty have already had an argument, and they patched that over. Now it's with Flanagan. So who, who is left to argue for the third one? I'm not sure, but we'll, it'll probably materialize. <laughs> right. It's a, it's a sense that, as, it's a sign that they're talking. Yeah. It's a sign that they are talking. And as long as they are talking, there's mm -hmm. all this jousting. There's, there's brinksmanship. They're sort of trying to, you know, play each other in the press a little mm -hmm. bit. But the overall sign here is that they're still talking and they're still progressing. I, I think that that means um, we're still moving towards a special session. And until someone says, no, talks are absolutely dead, I think that that's the logical thing to assume, that they're moving towards uh, some sort of uh, compromise. And here. the real leverage is this pay raise, because if they don't vote themselves a future pay raise, it'll be 20 years that lawmakers have gone without a pay raise. And that's pretty astonishing, if you, if you think about it, even despite all the years of late budgets and the scandals, you know, the majority of lawmakers haven't been involved in right. that. And, you know, it's getting hard to recruit members for the assembly, particularly if you live downstate where the cost of living is higher. So it's starting to become a real problem. And this is the leverage that Governor Cuomo has. So he's pushing for this laundry list of things. You know, when one item doesn't work out, he brings a new one. One of the newest ones is legalizing Uber upstate on Long Island, the, the ride sharing service, Uber and Lyft. And uh, now there was talk, he mentioned in passing, of some kind of tax relief, so maybe there'll be some kind of yet another um, tax cut, though they already did a really big one this year in terms of maybe getting the Senate Republicans in. So he's trying for everything right now, and I think the governor's going to push right up to the end of the, the year. I mean, it's possible there could be a session between Christmas and New Year's, which like, is kind of uh, the dreaded scenario like, for like reporters. Like journalists, politicians work to deadline, and the deadline yes. for this is New Year's Eve. Right? Yeah, December and, 31st. And another, another sign there that, you know, that they make about seven. They make the base pay is seventy nine thousand five hundred a year. Uh, when the discussion started, there was a, a movement, especially in the pay commission. We're talking like one hundred and seventeen thousand per year, thirty seven thousand dollar raise. Well, in the last few days, we've seen that talk ratcheted back to somewhere. Uh, around $99,000, keep it under six figures. Mm -hmm. uh, and there was no real big objections from any side about setting it there. So I, I think that you take that also as a sign that they're starting to sort of g gyrate, uh, focus on one set of numbers, and then what other extra issues get mm -hmm. thrown in there yeah. at the last minute. Of course, they're all swearing up and down that they will not, absolutely will not, trade a pay raise for legislation, but that, it appears, is exactly what's going to well, happen. Well, they don't want it to look like a bribe when you have U.S. Yeah. Attorney Preet Bharara, who's already, you know, convicted a number of them, including the former legislative leaders. You don't want to look like you're doing something for money. So they're trying to make the distinction, well, no, it has to be something that we wanted to do anyway. And also it's not going to be this legislature, it's going to be next year's legislature. Of course. Which brings us to the question of, of control of the state senate. Mm -hmm. On Friday morning there was um, actually a confirmation, the race out on Long Island, uh, John Brooks and Michael Vendito was certified 
Brooks, who is a Republican who ran as a Democrat, right. will be headed to the state Senate. Right. The Republicans have now finally conceded that race. It looks like the final margin's in the neighborhood of 250 votes. Interesting thing here about Michael Venditto, uh, he essentially became a senator four years ago on the strength of the family name, and he's basically unseated this year because of the family name. His father was the, it, well, is the supervised, town supervisor in Oyster Bay, mm -hmm. a longtime powerful politician. He kind of, uh, Michael Venditto won in part because of the strong support for the family four years ago. Now the father is one of several people indicted in a corruption scandal down on Long Island. And to, again, through no fault of his own, just being a, a Venditto, I think, hurt his chances this year. And so what this means is that the Democrats actually have a numerical majority in the state Senate, mm -hmm. but they don't have control, uh, thanks to Simka Felder, who's a Democrat who sits with the Republicans, and Jeffrey Klein and the uh, Independent Democratic Conference, who will sit with the... Until we hear otherwise, yeah, right. there, there's all this speculation about will, will he go back to the Democrats, but I think until, until he says he's going back to the Democrats, He's with the Republicans. And that conference been, is going to be seven members strong. That's next right. Year There's as also well. been pressure on Governor Cuomo because, uh, with a word, some believe he could unite the regular Democrats in the IDC. And he tried to give them signals before election, but I think that was when they thought that Democrats were going to do a real uh, sweep because Hillary Clinton was going to do so well, which didn't, didn't work out that way. Another excellent segue to our next issue, which is one thing that will definitely be happening in the Senate chamber on Monday. Might not be a special session, but it is absolutely going to be the vote of uh, the state's electors. That's the Electoral right. College will be That's meeting right. 29 Democrats, labor mm -hmm. leaders, a couple of elected officials mm -hmm. will all be there to cast their votes for Andrew Cuomo. But Cuomo's office would not confirm to myself and my colleague Matt Hamilton this week that he will actually show up to be an elector. Yeah, other electors are Bill Clinton, New York City Mayor Bill de Blasio. I think we could probably figure that they're not going to show up for this. Why should they? It's going to be depressing. And I think for Cuomo and de Blasio, why be connected to the Clinton brand anymore? It's obviously, you know, a thing of, of the past and they want to, you know, forge a new identity in the, in the Trump era, which is coming quickly. And, and on a sort of small scale of politics, uh, having a, a big name like uh, Clinton or Cuomo kind of have someone fill in as their proxy, it's a small little favor that kind of goes well with whether it's a labor leader or someone else who will represent them because it's, it's an honor for that person to be considered the elector to actually cast a vote in the electoral college, not so much for a governor or an ex-president. Okay, I'll play the devil's advocate. If you're a super fan, aren't you supposed to show up even when you know your team is likely gonna lose? <sighs> Doesn't seem that way, doesn't it? But not, you know, if, if, they got their own futures to think about. Right. If Bill Clinton shows up or Andrew Cuomo shows up, they're going to be hit with questions from the press about uh, Trump, the campaign, what went wrong with the campaign, uh, what's going to happen in the next go around. I think that's all sorts of questions that they would rather not face on December yeah. 19th, just six weeks after the election. Yeah, Speaking absolutely. of the transition, um, there are a number of New Yorkers who are now stepping up to take uh, prominent roles with Trump's team, correct? Yeah, there's a, they came out with a new list of transition. There's several layers to the transition committee. There's the executive, there's vice chairs. But in that whole roster list, there was a number of New York figures. Uh, Chris Collins, uh, congressman from Buffalo. Nick Langworthy, the, the yeah. Republican leader from out in Erie County, uh, is on it as well. Uh, yesterday, we saw a couple of Long Islanders uh, go into Trump Tower and have a meeting with uh, the president-elect John J. Laval, who's the Suffolk County chairman, Peter King, the congressman, one of the congressmen from Long Island. I think that, you know, and, and the Trump camp campaign committee said a lot of nice things about King and Laval. Mm -hmm. I think this is sort of like a sense of trying to include a lot of Republicans from New York as sort of a show of support for their work during Many the election. Many were early supporters of, yeah. of Trump, so they're getting rewarded. One thing we want to mention finally is the passing of Betty Flood of Kyler News Service at the age of 83. 
She was my next door neighbor on the LCA corridor. Karen, you worked with her for years and years. That's right. Betty had already been here a few decades. Even when I got here, which was in the 80s, she started with the Harriman administration. So it was really a long line of governors that she covered. Um, she started uh, the Women's Press Club in the 1960s. And the reason why was because women were not allowed in the Legislative Correspondents Association, which I'm a proud member of now. And she was a real trailbreaker. And if you got her going, she had some pretty good stories about mm -hmm. being on Nelson Rockefeller's plane, the parties that we all missed in this more staid era. And um, you know, she's a great lady. She'll be remembered. And you, can, you could have found her filing stories as recently as, I think, two weeks ago. Absolutely. Well, that is where we're going to have to leave it. So thanks very much to Yancey Roy from Newsday and Karen DeWitt of New York State Public Radio. And now we'll kick to Matt at the desk. Thanks, Casey. Last week, the United States and Canada approved Plan 2014, which allows for greater highs and lows for the water levels of Lake Ontario and the St. Lawrence River. It goes into, into effect at the end of next month. Here to discuss it, Jeff Garnsey, a third generation fishing guide along the St. Lawrence, and Jessica Atni Mahar from the Nature Conservancy. Thank you both for coming in today. Thanks for having um, us. Yeah. Let's, dis let's discuss the plan. This is one that's been in the making for, for a long, long time. <laughs> the public comment period, uh, um, geez, the public hearings were years ago, mm -hmm. 2012, 2013. Um, I guess the whole point was to update the original agreement that came in, what, 19, Absolutely. the late 1950s. Mm -hmm. uh, Jeff, I'll go to you first. You live along the St. Lawrence. Uh, you are in support of the plan. I guess give us a perspective as, as what you've seen over the years and why, why you support this plan. Sure. Um, I had kind of a, 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 the, the luck of being in kind of a time capsule to be able to see how it was before mm -hmm. and then what happened over a period of about 26 years. Um, my family has been on the head of Grindstone Island uh, for seven generations. We were, you know, the, in the 1800s when we first settled there. Um, and directly adjacent to my front yard was one of the largest spawning grounds for cold water spawners, the northern pike and the muskie, in the region. Um, and when I was a youngster, it was uh, Flynn's Bay on the head of the island, which is uh, a few miles downriver from the, the beginning of Lake Ontario. Mm -hmm. um, it wasn't uncommon to see 25, 30 muskie at a time up in the margin spawning. Um, and when I graduated, I went into the Navy and I was gone for 26 years. Mm -hmm. uh, and when I came back, it was, uh, it, if you didn't have landmarks, you wouldn't know you were in the same bay. The topography of the, the bottom and the, the margin of the river had changed so substantially that it was uh, spots that I used to dock my boat at were now 100 feet inland uh, covered by marsh. Mm -hmm. So it was, it was a really profound uh, wake-up call that uh, that something had gone terribly wrong. Um, so that's that's kind of two snapshots that I was able to see. So as part of the the existing plan that's in place now, what happened over that period of time uh, uh, in relation to that plan? Well, as you manage water um, using a calendar instead of what's going on around you, um, i.e., if you have a heavy snowfall to the west, which affects us to the east. Um, then you can imagine there's going to be a pretty heavy runoff, so you might want to get ahead of it, letting water flow out down through the Moses Sanders. But if you look at your watch and say, oh, it's April, let's start letting the water out because the runoff's coming, and you don't happen to have runoff, then you have an artificially low water level. These cold water spawners go in as soon as the margin melts, mm -hmm. and they have to penetrate the marshy areas. And if they don't have enough overflow, into the marshes, then they actually can't get in where their spawning grounds are. And a lot of these fish will attrite trying to absorb those rows so that they can survive. And if they're not one of the lucky ones that has enough stored energy in the form of fat, mm -hmm. then these fish die. And now as a result of that, the population's down about 70%. So it's a, it's a huge deal environmentally and commercially because a lot of people subsist on being fishing guides or tour guides or you know, just uh, just being waterfront yeah, residents. It's a big business up there for sure. It's, it is. Uh, Jessica, the New York Times reported last year that the Nature Conservancy spent I think a half a million dollars on a, camp a campaign in support of Plan 2014. Why was this such a, a high priority? 
Well, I mean, this will amount to the biggest wetland restoration north of the Everglades. We're talking about using nature to restore 64,000 acres of wetlands, and it's through a decision-making about how we manage this dam, as Jeff said. So we're still managing the system. Um, we're not completely letting nature take its course. Um, so the water levels will still be managed at a high and a low, but within that, managed level, there will be some frequency. And that what that frequency will allow is going to be the change of the water level within that managed amount will be that, that wetland restoration so that those fish can once again spawn, so that those wetland systems can be restored. And there'll be a lot of benefits. There'll be hydropower benefits. There'll be economic benefits through fishing and recreation. Um, it may um, help the boating season in some areas of the state. Um, and there will be um, shoreline rejuvenation in other areas. So there are tremendous benefits to this plan. Um, and when we saw the scale um, and the immense benefits that could come to the Great Lakes, um, the whole system, not just New York from this, mm -hmm. we thought that was well worth the investment of our time and resources. Longtime viewers of our program may remember that we did a story about this back in, in 2012 when the International Joint Commission was having public hearings on the matter. Uh, let's take a look at some of the comments uh, in Hamlin, which is just a little west of Rochester. We can't throw away 55 years of building. You know, I've got part of my life savings in my property. I can't throw that away. Stop this constant study to find some better optimum in the balance between people and animals. You're spending millions of dollars looking for some marginal improvement. We say, if it's not broken, stop trying to fix it. I was at that hearing in Western New York, and what became obvious to me is that there's definitely geographical differences here. The people along Lake Ontario, you know, I guess in between maybe Oswego and as you get towards Buffalo, um, did not support this plan at all. Uh, they were worried about their homes. They were worried about flooding. I talked to a number of people in Sodus Point. Uh, Jeff, I think you know where that is. That's mm -hmm. a little east of Rochester. Very concerned. The former mayor was worried about, uh, you know, their infrastructure and what it may do to their waste management plant. What do you tell the people who live along the shore who are worried about their homes and the values of their homes? Do you want to take this? Uh, I, well, I sure, we can both. I think we can it. both speak to this. <laughs> I mean, I, I would say a couple of things. Um, the broad characterization regarding people's opinion on this plan, I think, was a bit broad. So um, there is significant support for Plan 2014. Um, 36,000 people wrote in support or signed uh, petitions in support of this, including people in that southern shore of Lake Ontario area. So it was not unique only to the St. Lawrence area. Um, there were people in Rochester, and there there are shoreline owners who support this plan. Um, and what I will also say is that um, I think that there are some issues that became conflated during the, you know, more than a decade, 15 years of um, recent discussion mm -hmm. and analysis that went into the most recent version that was adopted as right. Plan 2014. When you live close to a shoreline, there are significant issues inherent with that. And they, those issues exist on our southern coast in places like Long Island and New York City and Westchester as well. Um, and there were a lot of issues raised through the IJC's process around taking public comments on Plan 2014 or Plan BV7 at one point right. and other versions yep. that came out that really spoke to the need for um, greater shoreline planning, community planning and management of those issues, but they exist under any management plan that exists. Um, and so it wasn't necessarily that I, I think that stopping Plan 2014 was going to alleviate those concerns. They existed under Plan 1958-DD, which was the plan that was just replaced. And so now I think what's important as we look towards the implementation of this plan and this huge wetlands restoration, all of the benefits that we hope to see from it is also at the same time working to ensure that those other issues that will continue to exist and that have existed for the last 50 or more years are addressed. And that's something we're also committed to. Jeff, you and I had an interesting, interesting conversation uh, before we came into the studio here is that um, the Lake Ontario, the, sh the shore there along the, you know, the Rochester area in particular, um, was different back in the late 1950s than it is now. Absolutely. How so? Um, well, uh, early on, before the tourist dollar was such a huge impact on the shoreline, 
um, a great deal of that now heavily populated area was wetlands. Mm -hmm. And as the population increased and as like commerce, uh, like fishing for, in for instance, uh, got larger, people wanted to get closer and closer. Mm -hmm. um, and with the value of shoreline wetlands, it was kind of, uh, it was kind of a, an easy eventuality to watch the chain of events as they encroached closer and closer to the margin of the wetlands, which would, uh, just like she, Jessica was saying, um, it is impacted by those big storms like in 75 and 76. Um, there were some assumed guarantees that if you build it, we're going to protect it. Mm -hmm. um, and when you live 100, 100 feet off the shoreline and you watch 15 inches a year of your shorefront disappear, change is, is terrifying. And the minute you hear something that says water levels, you lose sight of all the positives. And there's, it, there is, there's a tendency to be afraid of change, mm -hmm. even if that change might even be positive. Yeah, we saw some of that at the public hearing. We should also mention there's a split in the congressional delegation as well. Absolutely. Elise Stefanik, who represents all of northern New York from Plattsburgh to Watertown, is in support of this. She came out uh, this year in support of it, at least I know for sure. Mm -hmm. John Katko, who's a congressman from the Syracuse area. Chris Collins. Um, uh, by the way, all three of these are Republicans. Chris Collins out in western New York. They are not in favor of it. Uh, any chance, uh, looking ahead a little bit here, but uh, any chance that this agreement is that the U.S. pulls out once uh, President-elect Donald Trump takes office? I'll take a guess because it, any anything would be a guess mm -hmm. because if uh, to pretend to really know would sure. be difficult. But anytime you have a treaty that's binational, it's much more difficult to pull chalks and say we've changed our mind mm -hmm. um, because there are there are a lot of stakeholders on both sides of the. Uh, not to mention uh, the third nation. They're, everyone along the, the shore, all the way down the St. Lawrence Basin, are stakeholders. So to say we've changed our minds just based on uh, your individual politics, just like you were saying, mm -hmm. were, every one of them were, were Republicans. Yeah. But uh, um, the common sense answer is it, it wouldn't be easy to pull and say we've changed our mind now as a country because we're in it with yeah. uh, with not only the third nation, but Canada now. Right. Probably bigger fish to fry once he takes office anyway, but uh, <laughs> you never know. Um, so I guess, how do you envision the lake? And this is a question for, for both of you. Um, again, earlier, Jim, you and I were talking about this, how the lake's going to be in 30, 40 years, you know, after you, you're you gone, after I'm gone, our, our kids are gone. Um, will, would people be able to see if they saw that whole time period, a, a big change um, along the shore, up in the St. Lawrence region and, and down and, and along Lake Ontario? We, we, just like Jessica alluded to, we have the opportunity to recapture some wet marsh area that is substantial, thousands and thousands of acres. But the most profound change for us is going to happen under the surface of the water. Mm -hmm. We're going to see that rebounding of indigenous species. We don't stock, so it's, it's incumbent upon us to allow the fish that are indigenous the opportunity to thrive. And with the more natural flow, which doesn't mean higher highs, lower lows, it means a more natural flow that gives Mother Nature the opportunity to at least give her opinion, those, those, uh, that entire ecosystem has the opportunity to rebound. And I think that obviously I'll be, I'll be long gone, but in my son's and grandson's years, uh, I think there's, there's a real possibility for positive change in in the, uh, the population of the fish that's really degraded today. Mm -hmm. I remember talking to Jim Howe from the Nature Conservancy who represents Western and Central New York. He kind of echoed what, y what you just said is that a lot of the change is, is really, is gonna happen under the water, but it's gonna be beneficial for, for everyone. It will be, the potential benefits are huge and you know they include economic benefits, they include power production uh, up in Messina, mm -hmm. they include tourism, recreation, um, so it's, it's substantial. And again, I think another benefit of this perhaps is that we get, we get this plan in place, we do that good, and then we move on to solve these other issues that people are talking about. Because again, you know, those issues do need to be addressed and we're looking forward to having that discussion as well. And I think New York is a part of that. I think our federal leaders are a part of that. And I think that's also an exciting opportunity because these communities clearly need uh, to have those conversations and perhaps they can have them in a more focused way now that this decision has been made. All right, well, thank you very much for coming in to, here today, Jeff Garnsey. 
and Jessica Bahar from the Nature Conservancy. Thank you. Thanks, Thanks for, for having, having us. us. <laughs> This week's New York Now poll question is, do you approve of Plan 2014 for Lake Ontario and the St. Lawrence River? Let us know at nynow.org. Let's check out the results from our last question when we asked what should happen to Obamacare. Half said keep all of it, 27% said keep some, and 23 want a repeal and replacements. Peter in Queens watching on WNET said, I would keep it because this is needed and helps people with their health concerns. Greg in Rockland County told us, as a self-employed person, I did not have any health care insurance coverage for six years after being laid off from my job. My wife and I are covered under the Affordable Care Act and we are extremely grateful to President Obama. And Tim in Amherst watching on WNED said the Affordable Care Act is a work in progress. We should continue refining it to satisfy the greatest number of interests we possibly can. Thank you to everyone who voted. You can do so this week by heading to nynow.org. There you'll find all of our past shows, links to us on social media, plus our latest New York Now Throwdown quiz show with reporters Matt Hamilton and John Campbell, and a look back at some familiar Capitol faces then and now. You'll also find a link to the Capitol Confidential blog run by Casey and his crew. It's also available at timesunion.com. And that will do it for us today. We leave you with scenes from the Kent DeLord House in Plattsburgh where they recently hosted an old time Christmas celebration. The historic house was commandeered by British troops during the War of 1812, which they occupied until the Battle of Plattsburgh in 1814. I'm Matt Ryan, thanks for watching, and we'll see you next time right here on your local PBS station. Funding for New York Now is provided by WNET. CSEA. I love my job just because it's such an awesome way to give back to the community. Knowing that I can help out and knowing that I do every day makes me feel great. The work that I do is shaping the community in a really positive way, and I'm really proud of that.